Oh, we're live! Yes! Thanks for being so patient, everyone. Um, thank you. Sorry about the technical issues. We just couldn't click the live button. Um, welcome, everyone, to this um, risk webinar. I'm just going to do a short introduction. Um, this is Kabir, and I'll introduce Kabir a bit more shortly. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I really hope um, you find this a really useful process like we have. Um, I'm just going to briefly talk you through um, a bit about our experience. First of all, um, just introduce myself. I'm Holly, if you don't know me already, um, I'm founder of Indigo Volunteers, um, and we've arranged this training because we, we've we just been through this risk process and have found it so incredibly useful that we want to, to um, give the opportunity to all our, our, our partners and even um, people we're not partnered with to also be able to learn um, and hopefully by the end of the process have a rather snazzy risk assessment in place. Um, and in order to do that, of course, most of us don't know what we're doing in terms of risk or have any formal training in it. Um, so hopefully these webinars um, uh, will really help with that end result. So um, first of all, um, what is our experience of risk? So actually, um, a bit embarrassingly, we, we're a charity that's been officially registered for six years uh, with the UK Charity Commission, and we have not had a risk assessment. I'm pretty sure we should have done. No, we definitely should have done, um, um, but we, we didn't. And so actually, when um, I happened to be on Lesbos when um, at the end of February, when the whole uh, fascist uprising was happening and I realized how exposed we were without having a risk assessment in place because I really needed to refer to something like what should I do should I go should I stay here do I need to be doing anything in particular and I thought gosh we've got nothing written down and we've got no soundboard to go off and I'm making decisions on a bit of a panicky stomach so I just thought wow we really need a risk assessment in place um, contacted, um um, someone we already know and we managed to as a team mesh one together over that weekend um, so we had something in place and um, obviously we needed um, a bit more than that and um, going forward and um, so through a wonderful contact of ours she introduced us to Kabir who has been guiding us through this process um, and it's been incredibly helpful and um, so we we essentially took that risk assessment and we that was our base and we went from there so one of the first pieces of homework that Kabir said, well, first of all, Kabir actually did um, a presentation similar to what everyone here is about to hear about what is risk. I mean, I didn't know anything about the different types of risk. And as soon as I started being able to label, uh, you know, reputational risk and financial risk, I, I, what is your risk culture? What is your risk appetite? I, I feel like I knew the answers. I just never was able to articulate it before. Um, so one of our first pieces of homework was to think about different perspectives of, of your organisation. So for us, it was the volunteer journey, the journey of our partners and the journey of our staff. Sorry, there's a barking dog. We're in Greece, so that's going to happen. Sorry about that. Um, and, and think about their journey with a risk uh, perspective. So we all went away and did, we all took one, one each and um, uh, I did the journey of a staff member and what have we done to mitigate those risks? So one, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> someone's closing the door. <laughs> thank you Stein. Um, so what, what have we done to mitigate those risks? So I thought okay well if a, for a staff member instead of them feeling really lost and confused, we've got a really thorough induction. Okay, well, actually it turned out that's a risk and we've mitigated that. And all we were really doing, we what we found out was we've actually done a lot of work on risk by accident. Like we've, by just by trying to improve practices, we've actually countered a lot of the risks. All we were doing was putting that on paper and essentially formalizing the process. Um, so that was really nice and I think a lot of other like all, everyone listening you will all have done work on risk and you might just not articulate it in that way um, so yeah um, one of the things that's come out of this is um, we realized oh gosh what if if myself or Tass or someone gets gets sick from COVID-19 we've got nothing in place on paper so this helped us develop a, a staff sickness contingency plan as well 
Um, so that's just some of the things. It helps you to see where the gaps are uh, and things. And now we have this beautiful risk register where we've got the potential risks and the impact versus likelihood and then the mitigation strategies that we've taken. Um, and we can really clearly see where, where gaps are and, and work on them and put a plan in place. So that's been our journey. Um, why is it important to have this in place? Well, um, I just think it's really good practice for organisations um, to, to know where your risks lie and you can reprioritise. That's really helpful. Legally, um, especially in the UK, you uh, UK registered charities have to have certain risk procedures in place. So I'm um, sure it's the same in other countries. So it's good legally when you can say, tick that box, yeah, we've got this done. Funders will no doubt absolutely love it. If they can see that you're taking this really seriously, you're you're going to be much more attractive to funders. There's, there's a whole host of reasons, like it's just really good. And from our side as Indigo, for those that are partnered with us, we really want, um, before we, on our appraisal form that everyone will have done, it, we had like a little section saying, have you considered risks? And it's like, yes. And we go, okay. And we kind of take that as, as well, we've been taking that as word. And now we're actually look, asking to see the risk assessments because um, we want to make sure that, that it's when we send volunteers that we're confident that we're sending them to a safe place. We know that it is because obviously otherwise we wouldn't send them to you guys. But it's just really good to have that on paper. And actually, we might identify, oh, gosh, look, you're working uh, as an education centre here. And this is their risk assessment. And this is this education centre's risk assessment. Look what resources you can share to improve. You know, it's just going to be tightening um, that up as well. So I hope that you find this really useful. Um, I'm going to hand you over to the wonderful Kabir, who's been mentoring and coaching us through this process. Hopefully, as I say, by the end of it, um, you can have a, a, a really good risk assessment in place. And Kabir is going to really help with that. Um, yeah, and I'm going to jump off. I was just doing a little introduction. Hi and bye. And thank you so much, Kabir, for, for doing these webinars for us. I know that we're going to just find it so useful. All right. Hooray. <laughs> All right. OK. Right. OK. Welcome, everybody. Um, so we are on and um, just promise me that you'll let me know if you can't hear me. <laughs> That's I don't want to keep continuing. But I was just chatting with uh, <clears throat> with Holly and Seb yesterday, one of the organizers. And um, um, it, it, one of the things Seb was saying is that it is rather odd when you're speaking to yourself so i've got the video on. i just want you to understand what i'm doing i've got the video on and i'm speaking to myself i can't see any of you but i trust that you're all there and you're all paying attention but um but 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 this is one of those things about risk as holly said you know uh i the one of the one of the big things when we embarked on this with uh with indigo volunteers is so a little bit about myself, right? So I uh, I work as an organizational development mentor and a leadership coach, and this is what I do. But this is the latest iteration of, of, of who I am. Uh, I trained, and for many years, I worked as an environmental and human rights lawyer. Most of my work was representing indigenous peoples on land claims and culture claims, and I've done that for a long time. And then... More recently, I was the executive director of a San Francisco based private foundation, which is fairly large. And we made a lot of grants um, across the world around environmental rights. And in the course of my work, uh, risk kept coming up as as impact. So it's like, how do we deal with impact? How do we make sure that organizations have the kind, right kind of impact? And, and really, a lot of it was questions around risk. But <clears throat> so one of the things that happened was that when I when I transitioned from the fund uh, and I began working as an organizational development guide, uh, I was connected uh, by a mutual friend to Indigo Volunteers and they wanted to do a risk assessment. A lot of this came up in the context of COVID and Indigo's board asked them, hey, uh, do you have a risk profile? And, you know, Holly got in touch and said, you know, what exactly is a risk profile? I mean, what do we do now? Are we really in dire straits? We don't have a risk profile, so this is going to crash. And it's an interesting thing when, I, when, when you hear something like this, because on a humorous note, um, I would feel like 
Wow. Okay. So how do I communicate what we need without sounding like an insurance salesman I'm trying to sell life insurance? So basically trying to list out all the possible things that could go wrong in the work that you do, uh, which is, of course, extraordinarily unnerving. So the last thing I want to do is to be able to come up, come up to you or come up to all of you who are listening, or even in this case with Holly and her team, and to say, all right, okay, so you don't have a risk profile. Now, let me list out to you all the things that are going to go wrong in what you're doing. Because that is not helpful, A, but B, that is inaccurate. That isn't really how Indigo, for example, what, uh, operates. And I don't think that's how any of you operate. Because the, 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 in an extreme sense of risk or trying to understand risk is that there is nothing called a risk-free setting. There is always risk. And risk is basically the probability of an unlikely event happening that could affect that could adversely affect whatever it is that you set out to do. So the best way to avoid risk, I mean, think of it, I mean, if you were gonna, if I was gonna, if I was gonna make you smile, I'd say, well, the best way to avoid risk is sit at home and do nothing today. The best way to avoid risk tomorrow is do nothing tomorrow. And then the best way to avoid risk the day after tomorrow is do nothing to, the day after tomorrow. And at the same time, I could also say, well, now let's actually quantify the risk of listing out so many risks that we don't do anything. And really, that is the biggest risk, that we don't ever end up doing anything. And, and so a lot of what we're going to talk about is, is this idea of the, the reason a lot of us are doing what we're doing. I mean, each of you who are here have this sense of transcendent purpose. You're here because you want to have an impact in the world and you want to have a positive impact in the world. Uh, you're here because this is how you want to expend your life energy. You're here because this is what gives you meaning. This is what gives you purpose. Many of you find what you do a vocation or a calling. And in many ways, you're not naive. You've been in the world for long enough to know that, of course, you know, because you're not taking a fairly conventional job, you're not going to go out there and, you know, do your classic nine to five or whatever it is. And you're out there because you want to make a difference. Clearly, that brings with it a set of risks. Now, this is not all bad because it also brings with it some enormous and, and ex extraordinary gifts. The gift of finding meaning in your life, the gift of making a positive difference in other people's lives, the gift of making the world a better place. Uh, and 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 the gift of feeling fulfilled in terms of what you do. So all of these are great gifts. And of course, along with that comes a set of risks. And what exactly is a risk? The risk then is anything that could be an obstacle or that could come in the way of you realizing your values or realizing your purpose or, or doing what you want to do well. So that's really the only way to think about risk. I mean, if we think about risk as this big, you know, monster out there that um, uh, that we always have to be looking over our shoulder on, you'll never end up doing doing what you do. And the reason all of you, just all of you in this web webinar, the reason all of you are here is because each of you fit a particular kind of a profile, and the profile that each of you have is the profile of someone who for most part says, I'm going to lead with my heart and I'm going to go out there and I'm going to try and make a difference and I, will, and I will do the best I can to make this world a better place. And yes, but I'm also going to play the long game. I'm, going to, I'm not here just because it's in vogue today or I'm not here simply because, well, this is what I feel like doing today. I'm going to stick around and, 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 and ensure that, that the impact I want to have is actually realized. And what that means is, yes, we may have to be parts of organizations. We may have to build and run institutions. We may have to work with other people. Now, in that context, with this kind of transcendent vision that I have, with the sense of fulfillment that I seek in this life, 
there are things that come along the way that could come in the way of me being fully there. So along with leading with my heart, I'm going to, you know, check in with my head and I'm going to say, okay, so if these are the potential pitfalls along the way, what is it that I could do to hedge or to manage these risks? So what is risk really? It is about the business of living well. And, and really, so when Holly and her team came up and we spoke about this, and I, I said, remember, remember this, you're actually in a really good place. The fact that you are a functioning organization that has done great work so far, that continues to do great work, and you've got so many excellent partners who are all working and who all have a great impact, means that even though you haven't articulated risk and you don't have an explicit risk profile, you're continually assessing for risk and you're continually managing risks. This is something you almost do unconsciously. That's be why, because the proof of the pudding is in the eating, because you're running a pretty good organization. And at the same time, you're, you're constantly striving to do good in the world. So in that sense, you're living according to your values, you're leading with your values, but you're also managing risk. Now, what we're gonna do at this time is to make explicit what is implicit. And I think that is the ticket, to be able to make explicit what is implicit is to make sure that we haven't missed anything out and is to say, okay, if we really missed this, then how do we plan for this? So, so I would like you, all of you here, to approach this from this perspective, to start with the premise, not from a place of fear, not from the place of, wow, I didn't know so many things could go wrong, but from the place of, hey, we're actually doing good work. Yes, to do what we do means to accept that there will be certain risks, but really we lead by values. We are out there and we want to do good in the world. And this is why we're doing what we do. And of course, it's, it's an unconventional choice of work maybe, but this is what we have chosen to do because this is what fulfills us. This is what makes the world a better place. And then to say that we are already managing risk. We already do that. We do that instinctively. We do that unconsciously. And what we are actually going to do and what we're going to learn to do here is to make explicit something that is unconscious or something that is implicit. Because by making explicit, we can measure, we can quantify, and we can do a better job of managing risk. So, so I think we, we need to begin from there so we can all take a deep breath and really approach this very calmly, not from the perspective of trying to sell insurance or trying to tell you all the things that could possibly go wrong, but to always ask yourself the one fundamental question, which is that there are many, many, many things that could go wrong in this world, right? Nine times out of 10, actually 9.9 .9 times out of 10, they're out of your hands, they're out of your control. You can take Corona, for example, you know, a wet market in Wuhan, which is a pretty major city of 11 million people. And there is a virus, a zoonotic virus that jumped from a bat to a pangolin to human beings. You had nothing to do with this. It is out of your control. Now, even if you had the best risk management strategy in your organization, you could not have prevented Corona from happening. You could not have prevented this pandemic or this contagion. So what is it that you're actually trying to do? What you're trying to do is to say, within my zone of responsibility, what is it that I can do to manage something like this that comes? So it isn't that you could have spoken to you know, the WHO or to the government of China or to people in Wuhan about how to manage it. I mean, that is, not, that is not something that you can do. But what you can do is to say, within my organization, within the work that I do, within what we are responsible for, with the values that we have before us, with the vision that we have before us in terms of what we would like to achieve in the world, when we have instances like this that come in, what is that we can do within the zone of what we're responsible for to manage and respond to risks like this? It's as 
circumscribed as that. So it isn't about thinking about all the things that could possibly go wrong because there are many things that go wrong. And what may seem to initially go wrong may actually end up being right. So there's a much larger kind of universe that we live in. Within all of that, you are going to stay in the place of saying, what is the zone within which I operate? So the first thing to do is to be able to draw that thin circle around you to say, this is what I'm responsible for. And this was one of the first conversations we had, I had with Indigo is to say, what is it that you're really responsible for? Who are your stakeholders? Who do you work with? And what is it that you can manage? So with that degree of calm sobriety is how I'm going to invite you to engage with this, uh, with this webinar. So I'm going to take you through a set of initial slides. And we're going to do that quite quickly. And then we're going to open some space for questions. And then there's going to be some homework after that. So I hope you enjoy this because it's actually going to be fun. And the last thing I want to do is to paint a picture of gloom and doom because it isn't. What it is, is a rip roaring adventure of how you're going to get to where you want to get while along the way managing all these little things like checking checking for oil make sure you got tire uh, you got air in the tires making sure that you got enough food to eat along the way that's really what risk management is it isn't something anything much bigger than that all right so here we go i'm going to turn the slides on and i will ask my admin friends on the other side to let me know if it doesn't work so here we go all right and I'm going to, can you see the slides? All right. So I've sent all of you a message. So let me see. I'd love someone to tell me you can actually see the slides. Great. OK, thank you. I've gotten the yes. And so here we go. All right. OK, so this is something that I spoke about before, understanding risk. OK, so this is something I've spoken about before, understanding risk. And now I'm also going to check again. You Can you hear me? Just say yes. And then we'll start. So can you hear me? OK, super. All right, so off we go. Um, understanding risk. Now, when we talk about understanding risk, you'd be surprised, you'd be actually gobsmacked to hear that there isn't a work through generally agreed understanding on risk. We speak a lot about impact. Are we having impact? Are we, are we, are we achieving impact? How are we going to make impact? But really, there isn't a work through understanding of risk in the, in the social sector, C considering how much risk we actually end up taking. While in the corporate sector, of course, risk is a concept that is worked through over and over and over again because it affects a single bottom line. But a mainstream understanding of risk is the likelihood of an event that causes an undesirable effect. And this is by far, um, you know, um, a really, really boring way of understanding risk. I mean, it's almost like insipid and and sanitized likelihood of an event that causes an undesirable effect. This is something that you're probably going to read in an insurance manual, but that's the mainstream understanding of risk. And really what I would like you to understand risk as is what is it that could come in the way of us realizing our purpose? Right. Something like that. I mean, I'd like you to tell yourself a story of something much grander than the likelihood of an event that causes an undesirable effect. Right. But that's really where we, we, where we need to pitch this. Now, while risk is often considered as negative, this is the point I'm trying to make. In nonprofits, it can be a positive and a deliberative choice to achieve a deliberate choice with an eye to achieving an outsized impact. So ultimately, risk is what you choose to bear with, manage, take into consideration to 
achieve what you would like to achieve in this world. Okay. Now, now here's, here's something which is kind of interesting. I mean, again, you know, I'm going to use a lot of terminology. Don't get hung up on the terminology, you know, really try to kind of get into the heart of what is it that we're trying to do here. Now, there is this word called risk culture. Now, risk culture is an important thing to understand because what it really means is to view the risks involved in your strategy, right? Almost as an institutional choice, right? So if you in your organization have a mission, a mission that you would like to achieve and you have a grand vision that this mission is going to take you to words, then risks are an institutional choice because you choose these risks because it reflects your appetite, how you want to further your mission, right? So a risk culture reflects the organization's appetite for taking risks to further its mission, right? So really then you need to reflect on and develop guidelines to clarify what are the risks you're willing to take. So this is the piece what I told you before about making explicit what is implicit. You're just going to clarify what is it that you're really willing to take that provides you a lot of clarity, internal and external. Because you're making decisions day in and day out on the fly. Many of you are involved in humanitarian work. Many of you are doing emergency response. So in some sense, you don't want risk to be an afterthought, but you want it to be woven into strategy itself. Now, what is risk management? So if risk culture is really your appetite for risk what is the kind of appetite for risk that you have in order to be able to achieve the goals that you have the mission that you have risk management is putting in place guidelines and systems to identify and mitigate the inevitability of risk so risk culture comes first and then risk management comes immediately after that following suit so your risk culture is we want to go out there and we want to have this kind of impact. This is our theory of change. This is our strategy. This is how we're going to do what we want to do in this world. And that means that it's going to come with a set of risks. We are going to be working in difficult circumstances. We're going to be dealing with entrenched politics. We're going to be dealing with certain kinds of personnel risk. We are going to be dealing with certain kinds of financial hardship. Yes to it all. Yes. If that's a yes, then that is our risk culture because that shows the kind of appetite that we have. What, what is the risk that we're willing to take in order to get to where we want to get? And once you're able to identify those risks, then you put in place risk management. What systems do we need to put in place? What kind of guidelines do we need to put in place to mitigate the inevitability of risk? So in one, one super simplistic way of looking at it is having good bookkeeping in your organization is can in a in, in the in in a very narrow sense be understood as risk management right because there is when you're going to go out there and you're going to work in difficult circumstances and you don't have kind of you know pretty solid kind of business accounting or all the kind of services that you need in any other kind of say if you're working in london or something like that so well you're saying okay i'm willing to take that risk I'm willing to take that risk of, you know, money kind of being drip fed at times. Sometimes we have money, sometimes we don't and so on and so forth. Yeah, but how do you manage that risk? You have pretty good bookkeeping, you plan for contingencies, you do all of that. So in that sense, anything that could go wrong could be a part of your risk culture where you say this could go wrong, but this is the risk we're willing to take. And anything that you do to mitigate that is risk management. Okay. But remember, there is no such thing in this world as zero risk. There isn't anything called zero risk. To live and to live fully and to live with your heart wide open is to risk. And, and, and really, you know, woe betide people who are not willing to risk anything because you don't end up doing anything of consequence in your life. So in that sense, I think you've got to approach this with, with a sense of exuberance and courage, not from a sense of gloom and doom and how do we kind of avoid something, but rather to say, how do we go forth and do what we do but make sure that we're not naive about what is likely to happen and how do we plan for the contingencies, right? So, so I'm just going to, and one of the things that we did with Indigo was to do this risk taxonomy. And or, I know it sounds like a word that you'd kind of, 
you 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 hear in your uh, uh, you know in a classroom on biology or, or or you know botany in terms of what is risk taxonomy and sometimes there is this whole kind of borrowing of words from other disciplines but really what what does risk taxonomy mean just list list the broad clumps of kinds of risk you're going to have financial risk reputational risk governance risk personal risk and impact risk and we're going to get into some detail about what each of these risks are but this is just a way to classify and help you think about risk okay so financial risk what is a financial risk that's the risk of not achieving the impact for the programmatic dollars right so for example you could ask a question how much resources and staff time is the organization willing to risk to achieve the impact that we seek and asking questions like this helps develop contingency plans to protect the time and resources that you've already spent. But really, this is a lot of words to say something very simple. That is that you need money to do the work that you do. And your work isn't something where you're not selling widgets. You're not saying, okay, this is a, this is the fixed market. This is not going to change. And this is where we go. And this is how we, we're going to do it. And this is the kind of bottom line that we're aiming for. You're working in a highly volatile situation. You're making big bets. You're having hypotheses. You're having theory of change. You're doing, you're doing your research as you continue to do the work. And there's always going to be a financial risk, whether for you or whether for your donors. So you're going to write a funding proposal and you're going to say, this is our ultimate outcome. These are our goals. These are the activities that we're going to have. These are our objectives and so on and so forth. But both you who's writing it as a nonprofit and the donor who's reading it, both of you know that this is a gamble, right? Nobody can 100% say that we will, A, be able to do all these activities. B, all these activities are directly going to lead to this impact. At best, they may contribute to it, but you can't attribute all of the impact to your activity. So there's there's all of that. And so there is always going to be some kind of a financial risk of not achieving the kind of impact for the for the dollars. But but really, when you do write a fundraising proposal, what are you really doing? You're telling them that, you know what, you actually have to give us enough money to be able to achieve these things that we would like to achieve. You, you can't if we need ten dollars and you give us a dollar and you say achieve that. That's also a financial risk because because really that's a dollar wasted. We can't do anything with that dollar. So that's one way to look at it. But really the question is, what is the resources and staff time and organizations willing to risk to achieve the impact? Now, reputational risk, that's the next kind of risk. That is the risk of a threat to an organization's reputation or brand. Now, it could be quite simple as there, there is there's something that happens in the field where you you're, you're you're out there and you've committed to doing something and something goes wrong something goes wrong because you you don't anticipate a particular thing that is going to happen and you go ahead and you do it but that really damages your reputation either because there's an altercation with the community that you're working with or someone accuses you of something i mean these things happen happen a lot or it could just be a misunderstanding between your personnel and the community that you're working with but all of these things end up being a reputational risk. Or it could also be that there is a situation where you've taken your eyes off the ball and there's some financial mismanagement or money gets lost, that again becomes a reputational risk. So there are many events, including HR related, that could cause a risk to your reputation, right? And so sometimes you have to think about what is the risk when it when you operate in a time of crisis. So one of the things that you know Indigo came and raised with me when we started out was to say, so there's Corona and then we have volunteers going and working with partners and, and something happens. If we don't plan for this and if we don't plan for the contagion, if we don't plan to keep people safe and something goes wrong, someone falls sick, someone infects, infects the community that we're working with. Now, that's a significant reputational risk. So suddenly you have spent years building this reputation of a fairly tight organization that has all its controls in place that makes sure that there is a positive impact and suddenly now you're caught off guard saying, okay, this, you didn't manage something like this and now you really don't have your things in place. So that's a reputational risk. But at the same time, the last question here, what is the trade-off an organization is willing to make 
And I think that's important because the kind of work that you do, you are going to put your name up there in front. You are going to challenge the powers that be. You are going to go against the grain. And in many ways, you will be disparaged. Some of you will be disparaged for what you do. Some of you will be challenged. And, some, and in some cases, you will attract a fair amount of political ire. But that is the trade-off that you'd be willing to make. That's your risk appetite. You say, okay, we're gonna we're willing to take that kind of a reputational risk because we want we have another sense of what we mean by reputation. We want to be known for doing good work. We don't want to have a reputation of just kind of towing the line. So, but what I'm trying to point out is that a reputation is a big deal for an organization. So it's important for you to consider that as one of the sources of risk. <laughs> then there's governance risk, right? That's the risk of non-compliance with local laws in sites where the organization works. So that's again, where you could get hauled up for doing something illegal that you didn't know that you were doing illegal because there's a local executive order that's been passed saying you can't do this or you can't be out here, or you can't be working in this context. And so there is a governance risk there. So you could get shut down for doing something. So it's really important for you to know that you're actually complying with the set of laws Personnel risk, which is a big thing for a lot of organizations like this. I mean, not only because many of you may be burning the candle at both ends, but really there's also physical risk kind of going out there and doing what you do. And there's also a lot of mental risk. And, you know, many of you are working in contexts where you may not be living. It may be hard. Uh, and you're going to continue to do that, you know, with, with the possibility of financial insecurity, with the possibility of working in situations where there could be physical threat. So there is personal risk and you've got to manage for that. And this is one of the things that, you know, Indigo was also kind of holding to say, okay, both personal risk internally for our staff who work, you know, who constantly working and who working long hours, working in difficult circumstances away from family and friends. And there's also personal risk because they're working out in the field where in places where they may not entirely know what is likely to come up, especially in situations where there is, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, certain groups organize themselves to be able to attack them, for example. So how do we how do we deal with that? And impact risk, which is the last one, while the first four risks are direct risks to the organization an impact risk is an impact that 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 is affected right so like specific events as i said like elections new laws extrajudicial actions could drastically curtail impact so for example COVID, you didn't even know it was but it is a big impact risk because pretty much most organizations are grounded they can't carry out the projects that they said they would they can't achieve the objects that they say they will so that has been an impact risk and funders are aware of this just as you are aware of this as well now so moving on, moving on from there, there are factors to consider when determining risk appetite, right? So how does so how does the organization define risk in the context of your strategy? What kinds of risk are you not willing to take? That's equally important. There are certain times when you say, well, we could do this for this particular impact, but it is a risk that we are not willing to take. And what is your biggest concern? Right? Are you risking money, risking reputation, risking opportunity? Sometimes you may be willing to risk reputation in order to create an opportunity to have impact. And at other times you'd say, you know what? While we could have an impact doing this, it's not worth it to risk our reputation to do it. But that's a trade-off that you would always have to make. That's the weighing that you have to do in the context of strategy, right? And 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 really the other piece of it is that. Are you willing to do the kind of edgy support work that take you beyond your comfort zone? Each of you are going to determine that. And the more edgy it gets, there is greater risk and there's more planning that requires. And what is important is what is an acceptable failure rate? What does failure mean for you? What does it mean not to take a particular kind of a risk? And, and, what, and, 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 and what is the impact around that? So what what you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that, that we could do. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to stop right here. And I would like to open up for questions because I know that uh, we have another 35 minutes. So I'd like to open up for about, you know, 20 minutes of questions. Um, and I'll try to take some of the questions. And then we'll have some homework to share with you soon after that. So we can make sure that you leave on time. But we don't need to cover all of this. But I think this is a big chunk that I've already shared with you. And Indigo will share the slides with you after. So you can always take a gander at these slides. 
So I'll stop there and over to you, and I'm taking a look at the chat box to see what questions come in. All right. Okay, so we've got the first question here. This is from Molly. So Molly asks, how often should you ideally develop a new risk assessment? Or is it based, is it more based on incidents and events as they occur? Right, so this is a great question. So here's something that we learned when we were doing the risk profile with Indigo, which is that the heavy lift is usually the first time around. Because really what you're doing is that you are listing the possible risks that you would have that, that you will be undertaking. And <clears throat> once you start listing the risks that you that you should you should be aware of, and then you start then planning for how you're going to manage these risks, that's just something that you do the first time around. And once you do that, there will be incidents that may happen that fall within the framework of what you consider risk and how you want to manage them. So then, then you do it. So you don't do a risk assessment or uh, you may do a risk assessment periodically, but your risk profile is usually a one-off thing that's probably updated annually or once every six months. Because what it is, is to say, this is the set of risks that I'm, I'm likely to expose myself to. And this is the strategies that I have to manage that risk. And as incidents happen, it falls within the risk category that you have. Then you already have a management strategy in place that 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 you respond to the risk with. And after that, uh, that that's all you need to do. So really, a risk profile is usually a one-off thing that you may you may review once every six months just to make sure that you're actually covering stuff that you may not that 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 has happened since and you haven't missed out on anything so so when you say how often should you ideally develop a new risk assessment i would say the first time is the hardest but that's the biggest lift that once you do that after that it's just a periodic updating of your management uh, strategy of of reviewing incidents that may have happened in the year or over the last six months all right and the next question is by Sophie. Where does the risk to the community we are trying to support fit into these categories? Risk of distribution to a certain part of the community being considered unfair and, res and resulting in tensions. So yes, so this is the kind of risk to, to the stakeholders that you're talking about, right? So here's, what I, here's how I would respond to that, Sophie. Now, the community in itself will have a whole set of risks that is that is risks that is within their zone of control or perhaps their zone of responsibility or to some extent that is the risk that they have to deal with in some sense so for you and your organization what is important is to be able to delimit what are the risks that you exactly what are the risks that you are potentially exposing a community to meaning that what are the risks that you are responsible for and how do you manage for these risks? So I would advise you to be a little careful. And we'll in the in the next few slides that we do, I'll show you that. I'll advise you to be a little careful about not drawing the circle too widely, not holding yourself responsible for every possible thing that could happen, whether it is within your zone of responsibility or not. Really, the thing that you will be most responsible for is something that is attributable to you. That is, you're there, you're doing, you're doing a set of tasks with the community. By doing those things, you are likely to exacerbate a certain kinds of risks. And so how do you deal with that? And how do you manage for those risks? So the risk of distribution to a certain part of community is an important one. That is because you're responsible for that. So yes, some of it will be considered unfair. It could result in tensions. That's a part of your risk appetite to be able to say, yes, there are certain things that cannot be avoided. For us to do this kind of work is, is at some level in certain situations to be deemed unfair. We have to manage this in a way that, that, that perhaps work more closely with community leaders, have a more participatory system of how you do it, have a plan and a fair way of doing it. But there's also going to continue to be those risks. So it's more about determining what your zone of responsibility is. Next is by Taz, where 
Taz asks, how do we know what our risk appetite is? How do we assess this? That's good because the way you would do that, Taz, is by looking at your strategy first. That's a really interesting thing because ultimately, when you look at your institutional strategy, when you say this is what we want to go out and do in this world, and you start saying, okay, but what are the things that could possibly go wrong with this? So not so much what are the things that could possibly go wrong with this as much as what are the things that could come that could prevent us from doing something like this? And you start listing them out. That really ends up being your risk appetite. Okay, that really ends up being your risk appetite because, and that's interesting. Sometimes I think it may be helpful to determine your risk appetite by reading your strategy again, because when you read your strategy closely, you'll realize that you act, you unconsciously already determined what your risk appetite is. And what you really need to do is to make explicit that which is already implicit. So that's how you get to know your risk appetite. And so Megan asks, how do you start figuring out what risks you should worry about? Right. So Megan, so that's that's really what I'm going to do next. So that's a great question. And that's a pretty cool segue into what we're going to do in the next five minutes, which is so I'm going to draw your attention back to the slides and you say, OK, factors to consider when determining a risk profile of an existing portfolio. Now, <clears throat> We leave this aside and <clears throat> I'm going to take you to a particular place here in the slides. Okay, so Sheila says she can't hear the speaker. Sheila, okay, so I, th I, th I think the admin will reach out to Sheila directly uh, because others can seem to hear me. All right. Now, Let's go to this to this to this place of risk profile. A risk profile details the extent of risk you're willing to take in your work to achieve impact. Okay, welcome back, Sheila. Uh, so, ideally, an organization's risk profile will inform all your project level decisions. So, this is how you want to outline it. Where does my organization fall on the risk appetite spectrum? during my five-year strategy or three-year strategy, say 2020 to 2025. What outcomes am I hoping to achieve during this period? What kinds of risks am I averse? What kind of risks am I willing to take? And then what is the percentage of breakdown in the organization's work portfolio in terms of high, medium, low risk? So we'll, we'll, go, we'll go through how this classification actually ends up happening. Now, there are some quests, some things here that we will we will we will take up we will take up the next time but what what i am hoping to do is to actually spend some time talking to you about your homework which will actually help you really kind of you know lock a lot of this learning in place but the risk assessment cycle is 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 what you need to kind of pay attention to at this time so initially the first thing you do is identify assess and prioritize risks along the life cycle of a particular project. Then, so that is that is really your risk appetite. You're really kind of saying, these are the risks that I need to identify. These are the risks that is a part of my strategy. And this is what, and this is a part of the life cycle of a particular project. The next step is take steps to mitigate risk by considering inputs from staff, partners, and volunteers. So really then it's about, okay, how do I manage these risks? What do I need to do? And so then, the, and that's the mitigation piece. And the third piece is contingency. Develop and communicate contingency plans and protocols with staff and partners. And the fourth is invite and evaluate and learn from partner feedback. Right, so I'm just gonna take, take a couple of minutes to explain this a little more carefully. So imagine you and your team sitting together around a table, right? So you, you crack open your strategy. You may not have looked at it for the last few months, or you may have been looking at it every day. And you say, when, I, when we read the strategy, right, 
and we're clear about what our theory of change is, what our mission is, and what we'd like to achieve in this world. What do you think are likely to be the risks that we will expose ourselves to? Now, this could be a pretty big question of what do you think the risks we will expose ourselves to? So one way to deal with this is to start delimiting. And when I say delimiting, to ask yourself, okay, so within the work that we do, who are our key stakeholder groups? So for Indigo volunteers, the key stakeholder groups was one, Indigo personnel. So that was the first circle. Imagine a circle of Indigo personnel. So that is, that's one stakeholder group. The second stakeholder group, the second circle is volunteers because they work with volunteers. They place volunteers with specific partner organizations. They're, they have a degree of responsibility to the volunteers. And the third circle, which is the zone of responsibility, are partners, the partners that they place volunteers with because they owe a duty of care to the partners as well. So within these three circles, then Indigo now has to think, OK, so these three stakeholder groups are an integral part of us achieving our strategy or us kind of implementing our strategy. Now, with each of these groups, with the volunteer groups, what are likely to be the risks that we as Indigo should be responsible for? So they list out those risks. They may even tell themselves a story about a volunteer going to a particular place and this is the kind of things that may happen. So what are the risks that may come with it? So that's the first set of risks. The second could be from the perspective of personnel is say, okay, we are responsible for our staff. What are the kind of risks our staff gets exposed to? So you, they, they, they list those risks. And the third would be with partners. Okay, so we're responsible for certain aspects of our partners' work where we end up placing volunteers with them, where we support them. And in those areas, what are the risks that we've got to be mindful of? What are the risks that we've got to manage? So now they've got risks in three different boxes, but that's delimited by the kind of stakeholder groups that they're working with. And within each of these things, within, within the volunteers box or within the personnel box or within the partners box they could classify subclassify risks from the perspective of okay this could be a reputational risk one reputational risk could be a volunteer completely goes rogue doesn't understand what he or she is supposed to do ends up kind of causing a big problem with with the partner organization simply because they haven't been adequately briefed about how they're supposed to conduct themselves when they are working with a partner organization. And that's a reputational risk for Indigo because the partner will say, you know what, Indigo, we don't want to work with you again because your volunteers aren't effectively briefed in terms of how to conduct themselves in a situation like that. So that's a risk. So you could list that or it could be, for example, uh, you know, uh, an impact risk where where you place a particular kind of a volunteer with no skills into an organization that actually needs those skills and suddenly you have a square peg in a round hole and there is no impact at all let's achieve the volunteers dissatisfied the organizations the partners dissatisfied so that's another kind of risk but it's all within one box so what i'm trying to point out to you is that that's one way to identify and prioritize risks and the next step would be to say, okay, how do we mitigate these risks? So a simple way to mitigate the risk is to say, okay, in the case of volunteers, we have an introductory package. We brief the volunteer very carefully about what the expectations are, how they should conduct themselves. And we make sure that the skills matching is right between the skills of the volunteer and what the partner needs. And if the volunteer, for example, uh, falls sick or is in trouble, then we find a way to be able to get the volunteer out of the place. So all of those things become your risk management. How do you manage for that risk? What is the protocol? And once you have the risk management framework in mind, you move into develop and communicate contingency plans and protocols with partners. So you, then you say, okay, these are the steps we will take. So if something like this happens, so Indigo then communicates with the partner and say, okay, we're going to be placing a volunteer with you. We've worked with you on this. So if this happens, then please get back in touch with us. And then, and then this is going to be the protocol that is going to be in place once this happens. So that way you actually have a simple contingency plan of what you're going to do if something like that happens. And then this goes back to the first question that 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 Molly asked, which is how how often should you keep going back to this risk assessment? Then periodically you invite the last piece monitor 
periodically invite, evaluate, and learn from partner feedback. You ask for feedback once every six months, saying, how's this going? Did this work for you? What could we be doing better? What are the things that may have changed that, that actually mitigate the risk already? There could be some technological advancement that could eliminate a certain risk that may have been there before, right? So these things, you know, so that is your basic risk assessment cycle. Now, and then there are ways to do the contingency protocols. We, <clears throat> Uh, uh, you know, we, we will we will talk about later, but I'm going to stop there again um, for another few minutes uh, and invite some questions, if any. And after that, we'll just go with the homework in the last ten minutes. So the floor is open for any further questions. Okay. If if there are no further questions, let's quickly go over the homework that we have. So I don't know how many of you have had a chance to really look at the risk assessment supplementary documentation that uh, uh, that that Indigo sent to you. Now. That's what I'm going to what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite you to spend some time looking at that supplementary documentation. But really what that document does is it lays down in a great amount of detail the process that Indigo went through and the process that I'm going to invite you to go through. So what what we did with Indigo, as I'd said initially, was to say, if you can bring your team together, right, or even if you if you're just going to do this by yourself, sit down and identify who the stakeholder groups that you're going to be working with are. So in Indigo's case, as I said, it was volunteers, it was partners, and it was personnel, the three groups. And then I said, with each group, tell a story of what could be a potential risk that may have happened. Give yourself a story. And then from there, then list out the type of risk there is, elaborate the kind of risk as you just take a look at the slide and what is the likelihood, what is the need for mitigation, and what is the mitigation strategy, and what the residual risk is. Now, this may appear to you as fairly dense and ob obtuse, but it's actually pretty simple. So, what, so instead of really getting into explaining this risk assessment template, what I'm going to invite you to do is to go back and spend 20 minutes reading the risk assessment documentation that was shared with you. Now, what that document does, right, is that it's it, it really tells you how, how to go about doing it. And it really explains how this template works, this risk register template. So one of the things that we were discuss, discussing before the next webinar, which is going to be two weeks from now, is, 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 is really for you to get started, to get started just to take a first crack at this template. So read the document, right? And then there is a, there is a section on page six, which is called getting started. It's called story time, right? So if you can pull it up, separately on your laptops or your computers, you'll see what it is. So it says, it's about how do you write your first assessment and what is the way to do it in a simple kind of color by numbers, baby steps way of doing it. And you'll actually end up seeing how simple it is to do it. So you would identify the risk and you will assess its likely likelihood and you will talk about how you want to manage it. And you're going to do that and you are going to fill it into this particular template. So you can just take something really small and do it. You can just take one stakeholder group or two stakeholder groups. You can talk about one possible kind of risk experiencing and how, what is the likelihood of that risk? What is the kind of impact that the risk will have? I mean, you will see a legend in the, in the document that has been shared to you in terms of, you know, what, you know, what is the rating for likelihood? What is the rating for impact? And then you will just write out what the mitigation strategy would be that could help you deal with that. 
It's as simple as that. And it shouldn't take more than a couple of hours of your time, really, if you just sit down and do this right. And the reason for this exercise is for, for me to be able to take you through a process of telling you how this can actually be an easy process. It doesn't have to be a complex process. This is something that you do all the time unconsciously. It is, as I said before, making explicit what is already implicit. And one of the things that you fill a few of these risks into the risk register template. You, if, if, you ha if you're having problems accessing this document, if some of you may have joined uh, you know, outside of this kind of framework, then Indigo will send you a copy of this document. And then you note down any questions or issues or comments you have based on this experience of doing this. And you send it to Seb at Indigo Volunteers by the 28th of this month. And then we will have the risk management two webinar that will take place soon after that. Okay, so am I lost? Okay, Lucas says I'm lost. Okay, thanks, Lucas. So, so I'm going to stop there again. We've got we've got ten minutes left on the session. I want to be mindful of all your time. It's late out there. So. Do you have any questions on the homework? Anything else that I can add that will help you do this? But it's it's two hours or at best three hours of your time is all it takes. But what we want to do is to take you through a process of how this is done. And then if you need more help, then we'll talk about these things in the next session. So I'll stop there and open for questions again. Okay, there don't seem to be any questions. So it seems like everyone's pretty on the ball with this. So rest assured, you're going to get a copy of this PowerPoint uh, soon after this, if you haven't already. And um, um, back on. So if there isn't anything else, uh, well, it's one of those rare moments where we're actually going to be able to end early but i hope this was very clear and if anything my objective in this session was to really tell you that this isn't rocket science this is actually easy it's something that you do already a lot it's something that you do instinctively the reason you're all here is because you've successfully managed risk all these all these years or all these months and this is just about making explicit what is implicit. And there's a simple way of doing it. And sometimes the art is to keep it simple. And, um, but, you know, even though I haven't had a chance to see any of your faces, um, which is a pity, uh, it, I hope this was useful. It was an absolute pleasure doing this. And if this can make your work more impactful, but more than that, if think of this as a way of you really realizing your dreams, the, the dreams that you have for your organization, the dreams that you have for the impact that you want to achieve in this world, that is what this should be able to support you to do. It isn't about to, a way to scare you, to dissuade you from what you want to do in this world but it's to help you do this. And remember, the fact that you're here means that you actually managed risk really well. So you're well on your way. And it was a pleasure. And thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on this call. And uh, feel free to get in touch with Indigo and via Indigo with me if you need any other support. But it was an absolute pleasure. And I am so uh, grateful to Indigo for giving me this opportunity, but also equally privileged to be able to do this with all of you. And all of you are doing such inspirational work. So thank you for the good that you're doing in this world. It's important. Bye, everyone.